So today on the podcast, we're excited to have Mark Levin with us. Mark earned his BS in chemistry at Rochester, working with Allison Frontier, then moved to Dean Toss Group at Berkeley, where he studied some gold redox chemistry. And he recently finished a postdoc with the Jacobson Group at Harvard. In 2019, Mark joined the faculty at Chicago as an assistant professor. So last week on the podcast, we discussed Mark's paper on the enantioselective synthesis of difluorinated alkyl bromides which he worked on while in the Jacobson group. Uh, and today we're excited to talk about this work as well as Mark's experience as a young professor. Uh, so Mark, welcome to the podcast and thanks for talking with us today. Yeah, happy to be here, really excited. Um, so we're hoping that to start us off, you could just give a, a quick introduction to yourself, focusing on what drew you to a PhD and a postdoc and now to uh, being a professor. Yeah, um, so, you know, I come from one of those families where like the, the career options are doctor and failure. And so I think like they're still coming to terms with the fact that I, I didn't end up going that route. When I was an undergrad, I took um, Allison Frontier's organic chemistry class as a freshman. So I used my like AP credit and I just like immediately jumped in and I never looked back. I was like just so excited about that class that it, like, you know, I, I joined a research group that summer and at, you know, I, I think I basically knew at that point that I wanted to do some sort of organic chemistry research. It took me a while to figure out that, you know, I wanted to stay in academia, but, um, but yeah, so that, that really was what got me going. And then I was lucky enough that um, I got to do one of those like Amgen scholars um, summer research programs in the TOS group as a like between my junior and senior year of undergrad. And I loved that. So I, you know, I went back to Berkeley and I, I kept working for Dean and it just, uh, everything sort of worked out from there. Um, so yeah, and, and you know, what, what I think really attracted me to the TOS group and what I still try to do in my own group and, you know, every, all the science that I do is just this idea of being really curiosity driven and like, um, you know, not worrying so much necessarily at the outset about um, what the chemistry is going to mean. You sort of, you try something because you think it's cool and then you figure out like, you know, what, what is the best possible <laughs> use for this or the way to think about it. So um, that's, you know, that's, that's been something that I, I still do. Um, although maybe I shouldn't admit it so publicly. Uh, <laughs> the funding agencies maybe shouldn't listen to this podcast. No. Um, yeah. So, so that's, that's been my journey. I've just sort of followed my curiosity and, um, you know, I think my parents, as I mentioned, are starting to get okay with the fact that I'm not a medical doctor, so. <laughs> That's interesting. I, um, I, I re refresh my memory of like what you had um, kind of completed at in, in, in Dean's group and was reminded of those clusters, the gadolinium and the gold, or the gallium yeah. and the gold clusters chemistry. And I think that kind of comes out of there where it really is just kind of an odd, let's take a massive cluster and kind of see what it does to classic organometallic chemistry. And so like, it, re it reminded me of a lot of, of kind of that, that style of chemistry of just like, let's just throw it and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, and um, so actually there's a backstory to that project, which is that, um, you know, one of my coworkers in Dean's group was actually also from Rochester and he was working on the cluster project. So the, my co-first author on all those papers, Dave Capham. So we had been like lab partners at Rochester in undergrad classes, and we both went to Berkeley. He started working on the cluster chemistry. I was doing gold three stuff. And I, I, I don't exactly remember how it happened, but I was complaining about like slow reductive elimination rates. And like, he was just like, why don't we <laughs> throw it in? Um, and I mean, it was just, it's one of those cool things where like you have these sort of different areas that are, you know, um, sort of percolating in the group and then just all of a sudden came together. So. Um, that was really fun. And I really, I had a great time working on it with him. So he's actually, he's in Chicago now. He works at um, Argonne National Lab. So we've sort of like moved around the country together a little bit. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's fun to see kind of how people continue through their, their careers. Um, yeah. We're going to kind of, I think, jump around a little bit and keep this a little fluid. So you, the, the paper that we focused on, of course, was this enantioselective difluorination with Jacobson. And before we even get to that, um, Grace had mentioned this idea of, with some of these uh, real, you know, high profile groups, looking for postdocs seems to need to come early on, even in your graduate career. So when you were looking for postdocs, and like, it, even for younger students who are thinking about postdocs or staying in academics, like, what is your thought process for how to go about doing that? So, you know, I... I don't know how, um, well, actually, I, I imagine my story might be helpful to some people. I, I had a two-body problem, right? So my wife is an academic, too. 
She's um, a professor of biostatistics at Northwestern. And so we were looking for postdocs coming from Berkeley. And, you know, we wanted to, to find postdocs that were interesting to both of us and that were in the same city. And so there's not actually that many cities um, that have like, you know, professors we were both interested in to go postdoc for. So um, I started applying really early. I applied, I believe, like October of my fourth year. And Dean sort of thought I was crazy um, sending out an application that early. Um, and, and it worked out. I mean, so, you know, Eric has a pretty um, intense interview process. He actually flies postdocs out and, and like has them do like a full day interview, almost like a mock faculty interview. Um, I think it was about as stressful as some of my faculty interviews, honestly. Uh, and so, so um, yeah, and, 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 you know, I got, I, I had like a very funny stroke of luck where the, the cluster science paper actually came out the day of my interview in the Jacobson group. So like, as I was like about to give my seminar, I could see like on their computers as I was walking past, like they were pulling up the paper. Um, so, so um, maybe that part isn't necessarily um, super great, but, but uh, in terms of like applicability to everybody, but, but um, no, uh, so, so, I mean, there's nothing wrong with applying early. Certainly, um, you know, sitting where I am now, like I would have no problem if somebody approached me like well before they were about to graduate and say, look, like, I'm really interested in, in working um, for you. And, you know, uh, I'm not gonna graduate yet for two years. So we have time to think about this. And that, that actually helps us because there's all sorts of like financial planning stuff you have to do for postdocs. So, so um, if you are in the position where you can do that, I certainly would, would recommend applying early. And it helped us, right? Because once I had an offer from Eric, it let my wife sort of like then really focus on Boston and, and we could figure out like a way for us to, to have positions in the same place. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I know the two body problem um, is something that a lot of people have to uh, take into account. Um, and so being able to apply early, do you feel like most postdocs or most professors are open um, to the application process being so early, even if all of like your work and all of your paper, like your paper publication record is not as high as like a fifth year student candidate, for example. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I haven't gotten any um, applicants that were as nuts as I was, um, like applying that early. Most people usually wait until it's like pretty close to their, their they, they sort of have a rough sense of when they're going to defend, right? Um, I, I mean, it depends, right? So if you have maybe like a paper out and you have um, a letter from your advisor that says like, look, like there's some really great work that's going to be coming out at some point, right? Like we're just, you know, putting finishing touches on this and that and, you know, um, I think it's fine. I, I, I guess I don't know how it would go um, aside from my own experience. And like I said, I should say Dean thought I was nuts. So um, so maybe it's not good advice. I guess shifting gears a little bit to the, the paper that you published uh, in the Jacobson group. So when we were going back through some of the precedent, uh, trying to learn about these chiral iota variants, we, we saw that there were a lot of papers from your group where you have leveraged a, a similar technique. Um, so we were curious what the inspiration for this method was that you worked on? Totally. So, so okay, yeah, so, so I, I would say like the big advance in the Jacobson group, right, was when Steve Bannock sort of figured out that you make a couple of sort of key modifications to the, to the parent Ishihara scaffold. So you've got this like, you know, um, iota resource in all core, and he was using these like lactate derived amides, right? And the amides, it turns out, are a liability for iodo um, arine difluorides, which are a lot hotter than the corresponding um, like diacetates and stuff that most people were using with this stuff. So, so I mean, really, the big the big change that Stephen made was a turning those into esters, and then b sort of extending the chiral information from just alpha methyl groups in those sort of like you know lactate derived to like these now benzylic um, um, arine right like moieties that it turns out are really critical for an anti-induction. And so you know Stephen opened up this whole new world of like you know, catalytic and anti-selective difluorination chemistry with these iodoarenes that, um, that, you know, I think had been a long-standing challenge in the field. And that really got me excited when I was coming into the group. So, so actually, Stephen hadn't published it yet when I interviewed, but he was sort of showing it off as part of the, like, meetings. And I, I was blown away. Um, so I was really raring to go on, on some of that chemistry. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you've got this really interesting intermediate, the alkyl iodine that you get right after that initial fluoroiodination is a really hot electrophile, right? It's, I mean, depending on which um, source you use as like the, the benchmark for um, like its leaving group ability, it's, in, it's a better leaving group than a triflate, right? So you can do all sorts of wacky rearrangements. And, and really, it's just a question of like, can you set up your substrate in a way to promote those things? Um, I've always really had a penchant for like bromonium chemistry. I, I thought, I think it's really cool. And so it was just one of those things where I, I thought, okay, let's try these like vinyl bromides and see what happens. Um, and, and, you know, of course the, the reaction works pretty well just in the racemic sense. So that was, that was, um, 
uh, uh, gratifying. But there were a couple of sort of like pieces of dogma that had developed in the group at that point that I was working against. Um, the first was that like putting a substituent in that one position, like alpha to the styrene, you know, universally sort of tanked the EEs in, in like most of the other substrates. So we have a couple of examples in previously published papers where like you put a methyl group there, the E goes from like high 90s to like mid 50s or 60s. And so everybody was telling like, no, don't put anything there. You're never going to be able to get EE. Um, and then the other piece of dogma that had sort of developed was that like modifying those alpha benzyl groups doesn't affect the EE. Like you can't do any better than like just benzyl. We, we tried, it doesn't work, right? And so I went back and I, I like just made a bunch of catalysts sort of out of desperation as, I don't know how many of you guys work on an anti-selective catalysis, but you always get into that place where you're like in the mid eighties and you're like, I'm willing to try anything. So um, so I just started making catalysts and, and it had a very interesting effect, right? We were not expecting to see the sort of like alkyl um, substituents do the, the sort of like, you know, steady increase that we were expecting. And one of the things that maybe isn't so clear is, right, you got a really oxidizing catalyst. And so you can't put anything you want, but like, I guess maybe you would call it like a classic Jacobson trick these days to like put the pyrene or whatever. Those are not tolerated. You can't just have like big honkin aromatics, right? They get, they get oxidized by the iodoarene. So we had to be a little creative about like, what can we actually stick on those um, areas and actually still improve the NATO selectivity. So, so yeah, um, um, you know, I, I sort of like followed the methyl, ethyl, um, feudal all the way out to terp butyl uh, and, and, and it ended up working out. So um, that was really fun. I, I learned a lot uh, working on that project, but yeah, I, I guess just um, don't always listen to dogma. <laughs> it's one of the nice things about being a postdoc coming in. You can sort of look at, at how everybody's thinking about the project and say, well, okay, well, maybe you guys are wrong. Um, <laughs> I think that resonates uh, actually a good a bit with Matt, I, and Grace to some extent, um, because she works next to someone who basically had to throw, you know, throw the kitchen sink to get EEs. And so <laughs> um, we, yeah. we've all been kind of there and it, it, it is really, it, it can be fun, but it's also kind of mind numbing to just try and try and find what gives you that extra 10 percent <laughs> well and 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 you know i think i think it's kind of sometimes I, I i wonder what we're doing as a community like setting an artificial bar right um but you know you do learn a lot about about chemistry when you're sort of forced to solve that kind of problem and and i do think that like there's there's a lot of value in the experiments that like you know never end up getting published in terms of like you just sort of start to get a feel for the space right and, and we try to communicate that as best as we can in the in the papers but like I, I almost wish there was a way that like you could just sort of like transmit the the like general sense you have about an area of chemistry to other people without having to <laughs> to write it down right um and and i will say um you know uh the the like the uh way that we think about an selectivity right you do ultimately want something that's super high in selectivity if you want it to be useful for somebody else so um, and, and maybe we haven't even achieved that in, in this paper. So um, maybe I shouldn't, I should, <laughs> shouldn't say that, but, but yeah, um, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um. <laughs> I think we can understand that. Um, one of the, the, the things that stuck out to me and I, you know, and, and this is, I think something that maybe gets lost when you try and write a paper. And so it'd be fun to get your behind the scenes insight is, is the deactivation that you found with the catalyst. Um, where you saw that like, or when, when you didn't have that um, pentafluoro uh, sulfur group off of the, the terminal benzyl positions you needed, you know, you, you saw the deactivation. It, it just seemed odd that that was what kind of fixed the problem for you because it, you know, you're in a benzyl position. So it didn't seem like it should really affect the electronics of that carbonyl significantly. So yeah, so I'm happy to talk about that. It was a, it was a pretty interesting story. So, um, you know, we, we noticed early on in this chemistry in particular um, that when we changed the, the catalyst loading, we saw EE changes, which I, I mean, that was always a red flag, right? Um, and especially in a reaction that doesn't have a background. So like, if you don't put in an iodo area, you don't get any difluoro compound. So like, it wasn't just that we were, you know, out, you know failing to outcompete a background reaction. Um, so actually the, the second author on the paper, John Ovian, was a first year who joined the project like around the time that I had just started to get, you know, reasonably good EEs with, with some of the terbutyl substitute catalysts. And um, he was really the one who, you know, uh, pointed out to me that like, if you look at the full um, biotage trace of the reaction, right, and you look at the part where the catalyst comes back out, that it's kind of lumpy and, and maybe we should be taking a look. So I full credit to John. He actually was the one who isolated that decomposition product that gave us the hint that something was going on with that ester sidearm. And 
I will fully admit that SF5 is not um, an obvious choice, right? That's like a weird thing that we had to come up with. Um, it turns out that like if you play with those ester sidearms too much, right? If you go away from the benzyl esters, you actually do see EE effects. And one of the things that we don't really talk about in this paper, but is um, actually, I think, pretty well discussed in the HALP computational study, is that if you think about the way that the sort of like chiral sidearms are canted, you've got one ester and one arene pointed towards the substrate. And so there's probably some influence of the carbonyl actually on the, the mechanism of anti selectivity. Um, it's not as, as clear, like we, when we try to do the same types of analyses, we don't see like a major influence of the ester substituent. Um, it's probably just one of those things where like you have lots of stuff going on, conformational effects, all sorts of like, you know, secondary interactions. But we couldn't really go away from benzyl groups. And so you're stuck. Like, you have to get a benzyl group to inductively deactivate the attack of, the, of uh, a carbonyl, right? And so it has to be very electron withdrawing. We actually had to go all the way to things like nitro aromatics to get it to stop doing that um, that side reaction altogether. But then you have these two nitro groups on an air on a compound that has five aryl groups, and so all of a sudden it's not very soluble. Um, and so SF five is just this magical thing where it's about as withdrawing as a nitro, but it's more soluble than like an, than an unsubstituted benzene. So it just like it has nice properties for everything that we wanted. And you know, we didn't have time to tell the full story, right? But but that's really what it comes down to is you need something. We can't get away from benzyl. And we need an electron withdrawing group, and and so, um, but we don't want it to turn our compound into brick dust. Uh, yeah, so so that's how we landed on SF5. It's a cool group. I think it's underappreciated. Um, they're they are really electron withdrawing. It's a it's a really interesting functional group. So I was curious about the Sigmin uh, collaboration that you guys did. Um, a lot of times, I mean, this isn't the first time where Sigmin has been brought in to kind of learn about the the origin of the enantioselectivity. And I was curious if in this project, it was, it was mainly uh, we're trying to figure out what is the origin or if some of those discoveries also helped you in catalyst design. So, yeah. So I would say that it's probably the former more than anything, but um, it was an interesting sort of, I guess, another lucky break. We, we had a postdoc join the group around the time that I was working on this that um, was joint between Eric and, and Matt. So, so Jacqueline actually interviewed with both of them with the sort of idea of doing some sort of joint project. And I had started to generate this data that showed that there was some sort of catalyst effect in the Edo-Arian system. And unlike a lot of the stuff that, that Eric does, right, like this is a triphasic system. So we couldn't do kinetics and like rigorously establish and rate determining and anterior determining step, all that stuff that, that, you know, the Jacobson group I think is really well known for. Um, it's sort of, I, I think it's, it's all been a frustration with this chemistry, honestly, that it is so sort of like ill-defined in terms of the phase behavior. Um, so, so it seemed like a real opportunity, right? Because it would let us try and learn something um, given that a lot of those standard mechanistic tools were not available to us. And I should point out also, right, this is a, a system where full scale DFT computations are tricky because you've got a heavy element, it's cationic, and you're in a really strange solvent, right? You're in a DCM HF mix that forms two phases, which both have DCM and HF, and it's not clear whether it's going on in the DCM rich phase or the HF rich phase, right? So, so, um, so like, you know, it actually seemed like a really great place to apply these kinds of like linear free energy tools that, that let you still get some insight when all of those, you know, complications are present. Um, so, so yeah, Jacqueline did come in and she was able to really um, help us understand what was going on because I think you can, you can sort of appreciate, right, you've got a remote airing, it's probably going to be interacting in some non-covalent fashion, right? And granted the bias when you have a terpetal group is to assume that it's some sort of steric effect. And, and, and I think we appreciated that for a little while, but you know, when you look at the full catalyst um, uh, screen that we did, it, it's pretty clear, right, just I, I think we have an early figure that like, a simple chart and analysis breaks down when you add in electron withdrawing groups. So we knew it was something, right? Like I, certainly some kind of Aryan interaction, but it's it's really, I think, a testament to the power of some of these, um, you know, techniques that Matt has advanced, this idea of using DFT to generate new linear free energy relationships, um, or I guess in this case, SAPT, not DFT. Um, and, and and yeah, and, and we were really able to pull out like a, I think a reasonably strong case that something like a CH pi interaction is really controlling the NTS selectivity. You know, I, granted, right, anytime you develop a new LFER, it doesn't have the like historic benchmarks of something like a Hammett parameter, right? So you know how to compare a given row value to like hundreds of other reactions. And so that's the weakness, obviously. But I think, you know, as these kinds of techniques develop more and we develop, you know, a larger set of reactions for which this kind of analysis has been benchmarked, it's going to become an increasingly more useful mechanistic tool. And so it's fun to be able to participate in that. I, I really appreciate those techniques.
So transitioning just a little bit, uh, when we read this paper, we really appreciated the writing in it and the writing style. Um, and I just, could you speak a little bit about how the writing process goes within the Jacobson group or the TOS group and how you envision uh, teaching your students to become great writers, scientific writers um, sure. in the future? So, okay, so I'll, I guess that's two questions. So I'll focus first on this paper and then I'll talk a little bit how I'm thinking about it in my group. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I'm an optimist and I, I um, usually start writing a paper as soon as I have like any inkling that it's going to be a paper, <laughs> which, which I, 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 I'm kind of embarrassed. Like if you look at the dates on some of the drafts for this paper and then when it was ultimately submitted, it like, I, <laughs> it took a while. Um, but but uh, yeah, so, so it was a long process. And Eric is actually, I think, very um, intense about this stuff. Like there's, I, I don't know, maybe not a hundred times that we passed the paper back and forth among all the writers, but it really was, it was a collaborative effort and everybody got involved. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say this idea of like, um, fluorine is abiotic and therefore it's, it's interesting for an angioselective catalysis. That is something that I have been thinking about for a long time because it's also the way that we were thinking about the cluster chemistry when I was a graduate student, right? That you're borrowing the mechanism that enzymes use to achieve um, rate acceleration, but like enzymes never discovered cross coupling. And so like, it's sort of a similar idea that, that you know, you can, you can start to apply some of the lessons from, from enzymology to totally, you know, abiotic systems where, you know, nature doesn't use fluorine, it doesn't use cross coupling, et cetera. So, um, so I'm glad that that, <laughs> that worked. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so it's, it was a long process. And, and I think that good writing always goes that way, right? Um, none of my first drafts are good and, and it takes a lot of, of sort of repeated, um, you know, iterative uh, editing to get to something like that. Um, and that's, I think, something that we're, we're starting to do in my group too. So one of the things that we did during the, the shutdown that we had um, at the beginning of the pandemic was everybody sort of did a writing project. I sort of, and I, you know, gave everybody a bunch of choices, right? You could write a review, you could work on a fellowship, you could start writing a paper, whatever. Um, and, and, and we just started people's writing skills improve and the, the drafts improve, right? Um, even I think seasoned writers need a ton of edits in order to get something um, that really like is ready for, for prime time. So um, yeah, it's, I guess, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> So you talked about this in terms of writing, but I'm sure, especially as a, as a new group, it's hard to be an active mentor. Uh, how does that look during the pandemic? Oh, man. Well, we're still figuring it out, right? Uh, and, and I should say it's complicated also because I, uh, I was on um, parental leave for, for like something like six weeks. And so, you know, um, we had the shutdown, right? And we started meeting on Zoom. We did our regular meetings and we started doing more in-depth lit meetings as a result of that because, you know, everybody sort of had more time to focus on it, which I think was a really cool exercise. People learned all sorts of stuff. Um, and out of that, we sort of developed a way to talk about chemistry over Zoom, which we're still sort of getting better at. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we went from a situation where I was literally working in the lab in a hood next to people and just like chatting with them throughout the day about their reactions to, you know, a much more... Um, almost like an established group, right? Where like, I don't have quite as much of an intense interaction with my group um, day to day. And so right now we have sort of a hybrid model where they're doing written reports once a week and we're meeting on Zoom either once or twice a week, depending um, on, on what's going on, right? Just to, to try and talk through some of the issues, which is good and bad, right? So one of the reasons that people join a new group and I feel sort of bad is because you get all this like close interaction with the PI. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also good for everybody to have some time to like struggle with things on their own, right? There's, there is a lot that you learn um, when you don't have uh, me around to be like, no, 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 do it this way, right? You can, if you mess up and then you're never gonna make that mistake again. And so, so I, you know, I think we're all trying to, to navigate this as best we can. And, and um, certainly I'm not perfect. And, and part of being a new PI, right, is like, you have to learn how to be a mentor for people who are all very different. So I think like a mistake that, that certainly I made at the very beginning and that I, I, from what I hear is a very common mistake for new PIs is like, you try and be the mentor that you want to everybody, but everyone has different needs, right? And so you, you sort of learn very quickly that you're, you can't just do what, what you wish your advisors had done. You have to sort of like adapt to, to all the people that you have in your lab and the different ways that they sort of approach chemistry, the needs that they have, the, the stuff going on in their life, right? That they, um, I mean, 
I mean, the, I think the pandemic really like highlights the fact that like you can't, there is no just like grad school separate from real life, right? Like everything is, is all intertwined and you have to be um, aware and sympathetic and empathetic about those things. So that was a really rambling answer to say like, we're, we're figuring it out um, as best we can. And I, I, I try to be open with my group about that too, right? I, I think I, one of the things that I, I said over both visit weekends that I've been sort of a part of is, um, you know, I'm, I'm a new PI, which means I'm learning how to mentor. Um, and, and you guys are, are going to be part of how I learned that, right? So, so you get to shape who I am as a mentor and, and that means it's going to be messy, but I, I, as a result, I try to be a lot more open about what's going on, right? Like what I'm stressed about, um, what I'm frustrated with, what I'm, you know, um, and, and just like, instead of, you know, trying to play a, um, a fully formed PI, even though I'm not one yet. <laughs> that sounds like a really great attitude to have coming into <laughs> all of that, which is really good, I think. Um, I, I guess going off of that, there were a couple of things like, you know, as, as we prepared for this, I at least like looked through your your website um, a good bit. And I, I did, I actually really appreciated the lit meetings. I, I looked through a good number of them. Um, it, it helped that I found out I had a connection to three of the four faculty that you have um, covered so far. <laughs> um, they, they have mentored my mentor. Each of them had mentored one of my mentors at each stage so far. So my career, <laughs> that was really funny. Um, but I really appreciate that. And I really like the groups that do that. It, it, we definitely go to Barron's and McMillan's. Um, I think Miller sometimes, like frequently when we have questions about things, you know, they're, they're frequently popped up on Google. So it, it helps a lot, I think, as a service to the field. Um, but something that you don't see on a lot of academics websites, but is, is pretty prominent on yours is the group values mm. um, tab. So I, I wouldn't, I would love to kind of hear your thought process through adding that and how you like built it basically. Yeah. So, so that actually came out of a discussion that we had in group meeting following like the eruption of protests in the summer. So, you know, a number of my students actually participated in Black Lives Matter protests um, in Chicago. And actually one of my students um, came to me and said like, Hey, I think, I think we should talk about this in group meeting. So we had just a whole group meeting de um, dedicated to just like talking through some of the issues that were going on. And, you know, I, we gave everybody sort of a chance to express themselves. And, and, and out of that sort of, we evolved this idea that, hey, it would be really nice if we could just sort of like make a statement about what we think, you know, um, science should be like. And, and around that same time, that Hudlicky article that just really, uh, anyways, um, we, we wanted to basically make, make a statement about all of those things, right? And say like, look, like, like, Make people run their groups all sorts of different ways. We have this sort of like academic fiefdom model, but this is what we think um, and what we care about. And and hopefully, you know, in a very small way, we can we can help to make the the sort of academic culture a better place. And you know, academia is slow to change. That is a a strength and a weakness in various respects, right? But um, uh, and so we have to be realistic about what we can achieve. I think, but I, we all felt like it was a great way to just sort of put it out there, right? Um, and and it was very much a group process. So we had like a you know, Zoom, Google Doc, and I was like, um, you know, typing up like what people were saying and people were suggesting edits and it just sort of came together. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you guys appreciate it because um, I think that, uh, you know, we sort of put it out there not knowing whether it was just going to be sort of another piece of screaming into the void <laughs> or, or what, but um, no, um, it, it was really, uh, it was a, a group project and, and, and something that we really um, took some time to put together. I think it's really helpful. I've seen it on a few websites now, but especially for prospective students, just to have that as part of um, the department, but also groups that they're interested in. I guess you you went active on Twitter a few weeks ago saying that you can get reimbursed um, or not pay your uh, application fee. Um, how else are you um, looking to gather new prospective students? So, I mean, you know, um, I, I, I do like Twitter as a way to get this stuff out. And I will say for anyone listening to the podcast who's thinking about applying to graduate school, like, feel free to contact me. I'm allowed to give out as many key waivers as I, as I want. So um, just, I am, no one should have to pay for an application to the chemistry department, University of Chicago. Um, just send me a message. I'm happy to share those. I, if it was up to me, there wouldn't be a fee in the first place, but that's again, like a slower structural change problem. So we're working on that, but, um, and, and the other piece, right, one of the things that, that I lobbied for this year was for us to get rid of the, the GRE requirement. That was an easier sell this year because of the pandemic, but I'm hoping that what happens is that, you know, the admissions committee sort of realizes, like, look, it's not actually that much harder to pick out 
the good students without this. And it's a huge benefit because people don't have to break their bank getting, you know, taking the test, which is expensive, sending out all of the test scores, which is expensive. I mean, one of the, one of the times in my life I was poorest, right, is when I moved for graduate school because I had just spent so much money on like grad school applications, the tests, the visits, which were like, back in my day, at least were only partially reimbursed depending on where you were going and like how far the air travel was. And then you move and you're like paying rent for the first time in your life. And like, I just, I couldn't believe it. And I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't come back, come from like a particularly disadvantaged background. My parents are immigrants and like over, you know, the, my lifetime, we went from like um, living with donated furniture to like, you know, they're comfortable now, but, but I, I have sympathy for this idea that like, no one should have to go through that. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, so, so I mean, I feel very strongly about it and I'm doing what I can, um, you know, within the system to, to make these changes. Like I said, right, everything in, in academia moves slowly. And so, um, you know, I, I hope that <laughs> within a few years we'll have, you know, permanent no GRE, permanent um, no, no application fees. And, and we can start to think about other things like that that, that make a, a big difference. So, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I think I, when I was a graduate student, I didn't appreciate just how hard it can be to actually get some of these changes implemented. I sort of imagine that the professors like all have a big switch on the wall and they can just turn off the, the application fee. <laughs> it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but we're working on it, I, I promise. So we're, we're entering the graduate application season. Uh, what pitch, what sell do you have for a prospective student to come to Chicago? Oh man, okay. Um, well, it's a really cool, I don't know, so for organic chemistry, I'll speak specifically to my, my sub-discipline, right? I just think it's a really dynamic place for organic chemistry right now. So, you know, they made a lot of big moves, right? Like a few years ago, they hired Guangbin and Scott, and, and then now, now me. Um, so, if, you know, if you're interested in basically any area of organic synthesis, um, or you're interested in PIs basically at any stage in their career, from me all the way to like, you know, Varesh, um, we have someone that sort of matches that. And uh, I, I think it's a, a really exciting place to do synthesis right now. Um, so, so yeah, I think we've got all of that scientifically. Um, I love Chicago. Um, compared to the Bay Area and Boston where I lived before, the cost of living is like basically nothing for a major city. Um, so uh, it's, it's really nice as far as that goes. Um, and hopefully, you know, coronavirus doesn't last forever and, and um, people can start to take advantage of the city again. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so, so I think it's a great place to do, do chemistry. Obviously, um, you know, I don't want to take students away from University of Wisconsin. You guys are officially a production of the school, aren't you? Um, <laughs> Um, I think we get a lot of people who apply actually sort of regionally, right? So we see a lot of people who are applying to like Chicago, Northwestern, U of I, and, and, and Miss Medicine, right? So um, um, maybe I'll, I'll be competing with you guys for some students soon, but uh, <laughs> you can cut out this part of the, of the interview if, if, you know, if Tetrick is mad at you for stealing students. <laughs> I think that's the goal, though. You know, if, if everyone's competing, we'll just attract more and more, you know, very strong students, so. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's actually something that the students really don't appreciate until like maybe around visit weekend time is that like we're actually fighting over them um, more so than anything else. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's one of those things like I think, you know, just graduate school in general that you don't always realize is that a lot of the times you are much higher of a commodity than you think, right? You always think, you know, applying for graduate schools, well, I have to, I have to sell myself, I have to, but like once you're in you know, now it is like your choice. You have the power to really dictate where you go and which school, you know, gets to have you come. So it, it's something I, I, I see again, kind of following Twitter, a, a lot more people are trying to make, you know, more obvious is that like you, you, you have the power when you are kind of in that admitted student position to, you know, lobby a bit for what you want and, you know, where you want to go. So I think it is yeah. kind of cool. Well, and like, I mean, just think about it, right? It's a very specific skill set as a graduate student. You, like, there's not that many jobs, right? Where like, you have to do so much complex, like hands-on stuff and thinking work, right? And I, that was something that I found really gratifying as a graduate student and that I miss now that I'm like um, quarantined in my house all the time and I'm not working in the lab. Um, so, so yeah, it's a, it's, it's a cool job and, and it's a rare talent, right? So we're like, we're always hungry for people who are good at it. So I think it'd be nice to kind of, you know, you are starting a new group. You've been around for about a year, year and a half now. Um, can you give us just kind of a, your, your, your kind of sales pitch, your broad overarching, like what, what, what your group is doing, kind of where you want to go and what you're interested in? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll try not to be too cryptic, right? So we're, we're in the like process of like finalizing our first couple of papers for submission. So like, it's like a very, 
Um, I'm, I'm doing my best to, to, I remember when I was a graduate student um, and my, I was like, you know, whenever I was getting close to finishing a paper, getting the last pieces of like experimental data, that was when like Dean would show up in my lab every day and be like, so, so, is it ready? Is it ready? Um, and so I'm trying not to do that now to my students. Um, that, not to answer, that doesn't answer your question. Anyways, um, <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so our general idea is that we are really interested in chemical reactions that modify molecular skeletons. Um, so what I mean by that is like, you know, CH functionalization logic is really po powerful in the way that it lets you think about just taking a, a molecule that you have and converting it to something else like as is, right? This, I mean, you know, do you bring in late stage functionalization as sort of a motivating idea, right? I think it, there's a natural progression where you want to be able to do the same kinds of things that CH functionalization lets you do to any other part. And so that means being able to modify CC, CN, CO bonds as well. Um, and, you know, I, I have some, some competition right in my own department. Gongbin's a leader in, in CC functionalization chemistry. But what I am trying to sort of advance and hopefully will come through when once our papers are, are, um, are out is this idea that like, if you want to capture something that's really retrosynthetically accessible, um, that there's a specific class of skeletal edits that are particularly interesting and those are single atom changes. So like, can you take a single atom in or out of a ring system? or replace a single atom in a ring system to generate a completely new heterocycle, right? Whether that's an aliphatic system, aromatic system. Um, and so like with that sort of uh, very cryptic framing, I guess, that's what we're interested in, right? So just trying to develop reactions that do that kind of thing. Um, and I think that there's a real preference in the way that people actually end up using chemistry that, that you know, focuses on retrosynthetic simplicity. So I'm, that's what we're hoping to capitalize on, this idea that like, if it's easy to see the retrosynthetic disconnection, people are gonna be more likely to use it. Obviously that's the dream. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, the, that's our pitch. Um, do you, any of you guys wanna come post up? <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea that I, I guess I've been seeing that a, a bit more frequent in the, the literature, just like at, in, in people's like kind of pitches, this idea of like molecular editing, where it, it really is just like a targeted single atom swap or <laughs> things like that. And it's, it's cool, I, I look forward to seeing you were work asking. Like, I think we all are kind of really excited for, for work in that area. Um, if I can I, I try and probe just a little bit for, and it's not even on that, but just um, the, the last thing on your website, which is this um, cyclotron work, um, which I, I think it seems like it's going to be a collaborative or like it would be a collaborative work. Um, we followed recently um, Dave Neshevitz is kind of at UNC has jumped into that area with photochemistry making um, F-18 substituted like air really? and his photochemical method. Um, and he collaborates with like the UNC, uh, the UNC hospitals um, where they have like that ability. So I was just kind of like thinking about how you, you might be starting that up or like, are you looking for collaboration at the school or like, how does that even work? It's just outside of like our area, I think. So yeah, so um, I fell into radiochemistry sort of by accident in graduate school. Um, I was working on, you know, gold trifluoromethyl chemistry and we discovered this mechanism for fluoride rebound reductive elimination. And it sort of occurred to us that if we could intercept that with F18, we'd be able to make ready labeled compounds, um, having no idea whether that would be interesting or not, right? And so we started doing some reading. It turned out that that um, radio labeling trifluoromethyl groups was still pretty tough. And so um, we found a group at LBNL when I was a graduate student that was making um, radio labeled compounds for all sorts of applications. So they were doing a lot of work for, um, for like gadolinium tag things for doing imaging. Um, and, and, you know, they, they had actually, so, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with Jacob Hooker, but when he was a graduate student um, at, at Berkeley with Matt Francis, he did collaborations with the same small group at LBNL and that's what sort of spawned his program. So he's the one I think, um, along with Tobias Ritter who can, I, I guess, in part be credited with um, helping to bring sort of like F18 into like the organic synthesis consciousness by like, you know, starting to incorporate methods. There's, there's lots of other people who are involved with this. I don't want to, um, um, you know, snub anyone, but, but at least to my mind, that was like one of the papers that really made me start to think about it. Um, so that's a long way of saying that like, I sort of started realizing that this is a, an area that you can make an impact in as a synthetic chemist. Um, it turns out, right, that like pet tracers are, are just molecules that let you follow where that molecule is going. So the, the biodistribution information that you get is really, um, I mean, almost unparalleled in, in other methods. And so like, if you can radio label something, you can follow it. Um, the trick is, unless that thing already has a fluorine somewhere in its structure, then you have to make like a different molecule altogether, right? So the, the workhorse in this space is fluorodeoxyglucose. You take, you know, glucose and you do a nucleophilic, or I, I guess you make um, tosylated mannose and you do a nucleophilic substitution, right? To get a fluoro group in the equatorial position. And, um, and that just, 
you know, it works, but it's, it's strange because like it doesn't have exactly the same properties even as glucose. And there are issues with FDG in terms of the way that it, you know, distributes, especially in some, um, some kinds of cancers, it's really hard to tell the difference between the like authentic signal that you see in that uptake and, and just like background uptake because it, it doesn't behave exactly like sugar, right? So what I've started thinking about a little bit um, following that train of thought is, is how do we develop better methods for incorporating carbon-11? which is a much harder to handle radioisotope that also does um, PET chemistry. It has an even shorter half-life though, so 20 minutes um, instead of 110. And you know, how can we start to use that? So one of the things that my group is really interested in is trying to develop new methods for carbon-11 radiochemistry. And that may seem like it's like a totally different idea than this like skeletal editing, but it fits in very nicely because the biggest challenge here is how do you get a carbon-11 label into a molecule that doesn't have like a peripheral methyl group? Right? Most carbon-11 labels, you just make iodomethane and then you methylate something. But if you want to start going for core labeling, you have to come up with a skeletal editing procedure that lets you actually install that. Right? And the trick here is that, um, and what I really find gratifying about radiochemistry in general, is that like, it's a completely different rule set for what's interesting in terms of a transformation. So like, the things that we're all so trained in, in organic synthesis to think about like, what makes a transformation useful or not, Totally different, right? If you use 5,000 equivalents of gold relative to your um, radioisotope, it's still okay as long as you can purify it out. There's sort of like a, you know, we have to still get the, the radioisotope uh, labeled compound to be clean enough to inject into a person. But, but you know, the, the cost calculations are totally different. What really matters is just like fast and it makes the compound that you want, right, in, a, in, a, in, in radio labeled form. And so, um, I just find it really fun. It's a, it's a completely different place to think about chemistry. Um, and by changing the rules, you can be creative in all sorts of new ways. So, so that's what I love about that field. And, and we're still working on a lot of that stuff too. So um, it's also right, a skeletal editing problem and, and it just sort of meshes well with everything. I really look forward to reading those papers when they come out. <laughs> um, it sounds very interesting. Uh, I guess just to wrap up, we have kind of just a fun question at the end, but um, I know we visit Chicago quite frequently. A lot of people are visiting Chicago. Uh, do you have any restaurant recommendations or favorite places to go? Uh, my wife and I really like this tapas place, Cafe Baba Riba. Um, we, that's the only place we've gotten takeout from all of like the quarantine. We like, we cook otherwise, but that's, that's been our one like um, indulgence as we've been getting takeout from Cafe Baba Riba. Um, I, you know, we've only been here for uh, a, a little over a year and, and um, a lot of that was quarantine. So I'm maybe not the most reliable <laughs> person, but I definitely think that place is good. Um, and I was lucky enough that, you know, before quarantine started, we got to go see Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me in person, which was really fun. Um, so I highly recommend that if you can, if you can swing it. It's, it's a little annoying to get tickets. You have to like, ref it's one of those things where like they sell out immediately and you have to like refresh <laughs> really quickly to get tickets. So whenever they start filming them uh, uh, in person again, I, I, I definitely recommend seeing that. We'll have to check those out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with that, I guess uh, we'll just thank you for coming on today. And we're really, we were really glad to speak with you um, and hear your perspective on not only your own chemistry through your postdoc and PhD, but also looking forward to where your group is going. Thanks. Yeah, no, um, this was really fun. Hopefully um, somewhere in my rambling answers, you guys get something usable. <laughs>